Hello and welcome. Uh, I'm seeing people are still kind of coming in, uh, but we'll get started uh, right away. This is Attack on DEI, what's behind it and what comes next. I'm Adrian Dobb. I'm the director of the Michelle R. Clement Institute for Gender Research. The Clement Institute since 1974 has been at the forefront of uh, conducting research around topics related to uh, feminism, gender, race, and sexuality. And has brought together communities of interdisciplinary scholars. We're celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. And yeah, thank you to all of you for uh, coming to this uh, event and hopefully for coming to others. Uh, you can always check out our website for more events, more Kilimanjaro conversations like this. Um, and uh, we're very excited today uh, to have the latest in our ongoing Clayman Conversations series, uh, which brings together feminist scholars, activists, and writers who are driving timely conversations in their various fields, aiming to examine contemporary realities through an intersectional lens. I should note, uh, just in terms of technology, uh, this is a uh, it's, it's recorded, um, but uh, we'll be using Zoom's Q&A function for all this, so you cannot unmute yourselves or you cannot, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, share your screen. Uh, however, you are welcome to use the Q&A function um, and, and uh, file any questions that you have that way. Uh, in fact, we recommend doing that while the seminar is still going on. It gives um, the staff behind the scenes a little bit of a chance to uh, theme and group uh, the questions, which tends to help us uh, stay on topic and not kind of jump from one question to another, returns to something that we've already covered. So uh, yeah, feel free to um, put them in as they come up for you. Uh, we will only see them when 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 it's time for the Q&A, but that doesn't mean that you can't share them uh, early. Don't worry about that. Let me now introduce our amazing panel for today, and then I'll say a little bit about the topic. So our first uh, 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 our first guest today is Jamal Bowie, uh, who is a columnist for the New York Times, uh, where he covers history and politics. He's also the co-host of uh, the Unclear and Present Danger podcast on political uh, and military thrillers of the 1990s. Uh, and I should say that um, as a you know I'm, I'm I'm saying this in San Francisco, so the episode on the Rock was a particular favorite of mine. Uh, as a, as a San Franciscan and a '90s action buff, I was I was uh, very pleased to see that covered. Uh, prior to the Times, he was a chief political correspondent for Slate, and before that, he was a staff writer at the Daily Beast. He's also held fellowships at the American Prospect and the Nation magazine. He attended the University of Virginia, where he graduated with degrees in political and social thought and government. Um, our second panelist is Hakeem Jefferson, an assistant professor of political science at Stanford. Uh, his research focuses broadly on questions related to race and identity. He's the faculty director of the Program on Identity, Democracy, and Justice at the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law. He's also an affiliate with Stanford Center for the Comparative Studies, a Study in Race and Ethnicity. And finally, our third panelist is Moira Weigel, an assistant professor of communication studies at Northeastern University, a faculty associate of the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard Law, uh, and a founder of Logic Magazine. Uh, she's also the author of Labor of Love, The Invention of Dating, and co-editor with Ben Tarnoff of Voices from the Valley uh, from 2020, as well as a regular contributor to The Guardian, The New Republic, uh, and The New York Times, among other publications. She's currently working on a book about transnational e-commerce. And now uh, on to uh, our discussion of what it's about. Uh, it is about an attack on DEI across the country, but what are we really talking about when we talk about DEI? Seems important at the outset for our uh, for our audience to acknowledge that we're not going to be debating probably the relative merits of various programs on diversity, equity, and inclusion. There are interesting conversations to be had about that, uh, whether they work, uh, what they're supposed to accomplish. Uh, and how they might work better. But that's not the attack that we're thinking about today. And the DEI, and kind of in quotation marks, that is under attack, is another one of these objects of public scrutiny and panic that decisively exceeds and differs from the real thing. What, you know, um, you know, to to come to, to give an example that, that folks are probably familiar with, you know, the thing that large parts of the American public freaked out about 
under the moniker critical race theory, of course, wasn't identical to the academic field of study that went by that name, but it wasn't entirely distinct from it either. And the same appears to be true for the recent flurry of discourse about DEI. So let's first uh, name some names and explain a little bit the, the, the framing of this conversation. Uh, the panic appears to have gotten started pretty much in 2020, on, hot on the heels of the George Floyd protests, and it really gathered steam just last year. Um, you'll probably hear the name of Chris Rufo in this hour at some point, um, and and uh, he definitely has done a lot to, you know, conservative activists like him have, have been very, very um, central in spreading this, but I'm guessing we're going to all hear that that's in some way a sideshow and that there's there also there's much broader change going on here. Um, and we should especially emphasize, especially given that we are likely to have some people working in that space in the audience, that this panic is not a mere media or discourse phenomenon. There have been a raft of anti-DEI legislations and what that means really differs from, from law to law. Uh, 82 of these have been introduced in about a dozen states, 13 have final legislative approval, 12 have become law, 38 have been tabled, failed to pass or vetoed. I'm guessing that our three panelists will nuance this a little further, but you know, just as a sort of working uh, uh, definition, I propose that the I as an object of discourse really combines three levels of meaning, and that the effectiveness of this moniker in public discourse lies in some sense in the fact that it collapses these different levels of meaning. Uh, so the first level of meaning is simply there's the specific language theory and practice used in actual DEI programs, right? Christopher Rufo made his name kind of outing these and circulating these for, for conservative audiences. But in the second level, DEI also becomes a way like affirmative action until you know last year uh, to question diversity as a goal for organizations uh, or society to cool. This is the level at which DEI is usually juxtaposed with meritocracy, whatever that means. This is the sense in which a lot of the debate over Claudine Gay's uh, tenure as president of Harvard, I think, employed or came back to this DEI question again and again. Um, and there's the third level of signification where DEI just becomes code um, for putting up for debate the presence of uh, people of color, or especially Black Americans, in various spaces. Um, you know, uh, th there was the infamous uh, example of. Uh, the mayor of of Baltimore uh, becoming a, a quote unquote DEI mayor in certain uh, right wing tw Twitter spheres, uh, right? It's it's no longer about hiring practices or any kind of uh, any kind of program you might attend. That's about the presence of a black mayor, uh, specifically a black person in in uh, in a position of power. Um, I don't want to preempt the longer conversation. But I'm flagging this at the outset just so people aren't confused. Uh, we're going to be talking about the EI programs, I'm sure, of the type that many of you may be familiar with. Um, but I, I think it's important to, to point out that uh, we need to also be talking about what else people attack by thematizing them. We'll be talking about, I expect, the specific mode of escalation, too, that public discourse in this country has become so good at at this point, where someone's misbegotten slide in an HR meeting in some insurance company or you know university um, launches a moral panic that is covertly or not so covertly about defending established hierarchies. So um, with that, I want to turn to our panelists. And as a first question, I kind of just wanted to ask each of you to give a sense of how you what brings you to this topic. Uh, what what got you? What what makes you interested in? Why do you think it's a central thing to be talking about right now? And maybe I'll speak for myself, uh, right? Uh, you know, right off the bat, that you know I've been working on a book on or even on several books on cancel culture discourses for the past four years, um, which I think turns out to be very much a simpatico discourse with DEI. Uh, first, in the sense that I'm pretty sure that both discourses are just kind of straight up moral panics, but also that it's about that last point I talked about, and that it's about established hierarchies. Cancel culture is about who gets to talk, whose silence makes discourse illegitimate, uh, who gets to frame debate. And DEI is about all those things too, but it's it maybe adds the biggest question of them all, who gets to even be 
uh, in certain spaces. And that's why I'm, I was interested in, in convening this group and why I'm so excited that you uh, could all join me. So I thought maybe Jamal, you could uh, take it from here and give us a sense of what, how you would, how you come to this topic. Sure. Um, and, and thank you. I uh, thank you to Clayman uh, Institute for, for having us. Um, you know, I come to this more as a political observer than anything else, just sort of noticing uh, and taking stock of uh, the kind of almost cyclical sort of patterns, uh, the, sorry, the cyclical, cyclical panics against various, um, you know, three letter acronyms. You already mentioned CRT. Uh, and I live here in Virginia where CRT became like, a, you know, the, 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 the term of our recent gubernatorial race and, and uh, is widely attributed to the Republican governor winning sort of um, taking and, and take, taking and, and uh, uh, working from uh, the reactionary energy of various conservative parents groups and kind of folding this into this like this set of anxieties about what kids are learning and what, what what's being taught and who is teaching it and so on and so forth. And so for me, like observing like the rise of DEI as like the, the latest version of this has been interesting to me. It's been interesting to me um, to get to sort of uh, to uh, you have you delineated three ways in which DEI works um, at the level of discourse. And the second two, uh, uh, you know, it, it's been striking to me since the, 2020 George Floyd protests to watch slow moving. It's not quite slow moving. It's like like medium moving um, backlash to it take shape uh, in various forms. Right, the CRT. Well, I mean, you could even start with the 1619 backlash, which is happening around the same time. The CRT backlash and the DEI backlash, and at each at each stage, you're seeing a different target. With with the 1619 backlash, it was who, I mean. To, 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 to not be to not to not beat around the bush about it who are these people to say that they can recontextualize American history right like the accuracy of the claims was almost a sideshow to the the what, what to me was like the real anger which is that sort of like not just the New York Times but all these black people are saying that they know something about the nature of American history that we do not. Um, the CRT panic, the CRT backlash. Likewise, um, what are these people <laughs> teaching our kids? Uh, and the target ends up being, right, it ends up being books about Ruby, uh, Ruby Bridges and John Lewis, right? It, it's very clear what the uh, aim is and what the reaction is, right? That uh, uh, if, if the George Floyd protests showed, uh, you know, millions of young white people right? Marching in the streets. Now, who is responsible for the fact that these young white people would react against the established social order? Must be these books are getting in school. And then DEI seems to be like the natural progression, right? Okay, we've gotten the history, we've gotten the, the books and ideas. Well, these people are in these spaces too. And it's been striking to me, and I'll, I'll wrap up here, it's been striking to me to see the extent to which there's not even any attempt to hide the idea that what is actually being complained about here is the presence and legitimacy of Black Americans in elite spaces. Like there really isn't much of a, oh, this is not what we're talking about. When someone like the aforementioned Christopher Rufo seems to be kind of throwing dots at random scholars of color and saying that's a DEI hire, it kind of gives up, gives up the gate. Um, and so what I, I'm interested in this as an observer uh, and as someone who does see this kind of this roiling backlash um, uh, that I'm sure will have some other form, right, uh, come the next election cycle. Thank you. So I think, Hakeem, would you, would you want to go next? Uh, thanks, Adrian, and thanks to Clayman for having all of us. It's a real privilege uh, to be in conversation uh, about this with all of you. So I come to this topic as a political psychologist who's uh, really interested in how people come to the attitudes that they have, uh, why do people do what they do, uh, and not relying solely on their own explanations, but trying to dig deep to understand what motivates us, what motivates our thinking about uh, critical issues of the day. Uh, I spend most of my time uh, thinking about the politics of African-Americans, 
Uh, and my grad students often make fun of me because in the identity class I teach, uh, there are four uh, words that come up quite often. Power, status, regard, and esteem. Power, status, regard, and esteem. And I can't think about attacks on DEI without thinking uh, that white Americans, as traditionally oppressed groups have often uh, thought about these things, are wrestling with concerns about power, as Adrian and Jamel have both pointed out, who has it, who has discursive power, who has material power, who gets to decide what we talk about and how we talk about it, and who gets to wield real power, material power that decides who gets what and how they get it. White Americans, as a lot of good social science research shows, are increasingly aware of their whiteness uh, and their power and social hierarchy. A deep concerns is our colleague Ashley Jardina writes about in White Identity Politics, but concerns that date back to the 1950s with sociologists like Herbert Bloomer, who are pointing out that white people are worried, uh, that dominant groups are worried about who has designs on their place and hierarchy. And my work on African Americans, I think a lot about how marginalized group members concern themselves with how the group is viewed by others, these concerns about esteem and public regard. Uh, so as Jamel raises uh, the 1619 Project uh, and some work that I've been doing with uh, Koji Takahashi and Alison Earl, two social psychologists, thinking about why it is white Americans resist uh, information about race and racism. We think very actively about how uh, insights about race and conversations like this one about white racism, uh, how that poses a kind of identity threat uh, to many white Americans who are worried about the changing nature of whiteness and view of other uh, social groups. Uh, and so these kinds of concerns that we have long thought about attaching to marginalizations, attaching to subordination and subjugation, these are concerns that many white Americans, perceiving that their own status is shifting, increasingly take on as their own. Uh, and and I'll just say this: I mean, we are seeing uh, we are seeing the legislating of white identity politics. The brazenness that Jamel points out is something that has been striking to me too. There is no hiding what this is about. The banning of of books about black people. The the curtailing of the teaching of, of the history of race and racism in the U.S. As ta Coates calls it, it's cancel culture by policy. Uh, and the final thing I'll say, at least in this, in this part of the conversation, is that what's striking to me, too, is the sometimes tacit and sometimes not so much uh, tacit complicity and buy-in of those we often regard as white liberals. Uh, that it shouldn't be lost on us that one of the reasons that this effort has been so successful is because in small and not so small ways, people in our orbit, those we often regard as having quote unquote good politics, are also frustrated by the insistence that we talk about race. They too, like me and Jamel, are taking jobs that they deserve. Uh, they don't always say it in polite company. Uh, but I think as we have this conversation, we shouldn't just talk about uh, white conservatives. We should also understand that this is a politics. This is a psychology uh, that has its location, too, among those uh, we often leave out of conversations like this one. Uh, so I'll stop there. Great, thank you. Um, well, Akeem and Jamel, oh, sorry, am I frozen? No. <laughs> Um, Hakeem and Jamel have given me so much more to think about, but to respond to just the initial question from Adrian about how I come to this topic. Um, I'm a, I originally did my PhD in comparative literature, but I'm a historian of media and technology. And so I come as it 
come at it as someone who thinks about histories of the kinds of power formations and identity formations, political formations we've been talking about, but specifically how they get mediated through discourses, sort of different forms of representation and ways people speak in public, uh, but then also the material base of the media technologies that are used to circulate and disseminate those discourses. So, you know, Twitter, Fox News, MSNBC, uh, also pamphlets distributed in the 18th the 19th centuries. Um, and it was in this capacity that I first started getting interested in how um, terms like political correctness or cultural Marxism or cancel culture or wokeness or DEI start to circulate uh, in different media spaces. My much more autobiographical version of this story is that I published a feminist book in the summer of 2016 that I ended up going around talking about a lot. Uh, and that was a great way, particularly if you happen to be as I was, uh, someone who'd studied histories of 20th century fascism uh, in the European context, a great way to get really interested in what was going on with new media and the way um, racist and misogynist and xenophobic forms of discourse were circulating on them. Um, so I think the only thing I'd want to add um, to what's been said already is that having spent a fair bit of time looking at how similar sort of cyclical, uh, as Jamel said, moral panics about say political correctness uh, or CRT or cultural Marxism circulated uh, in the past decade. You know, before that there were periods of circulation for those terms in the 1990s. We could talk about why, but having some spent some time sort of reading a great deal uh, of books, a great deal of the literature produced for audiences avowedly hostile to C CRT, explaining what it is, for instance, uh, which I'm interested in. I'm interested in how these terms get picked up and constructed as objects uh, of panic or sort of catalysts for, for new kinds of um, racist, misogynist, xenophobic political formations. Uh, the thing that strikes me as a little bit different about DEI, even while so much of it feels the same as things that have been said about PC or CRT before is this explicit focus on organizations and institutions uh, and the way that DEI for figures like Rufo uh, or Vivek Ramaswamy uh, or others who have talked about it uh, specifically evokes not just the public sphere, whatever that is, because I think the public sphere is under enough transformation uh, that we you know, need to be a bit more precise by what we're talking about when we talk about it, but not just in the public sphere in general, and not even just at universities, but also in federal bureaucracies and corporations and so on. And to the extent that in my view, these moral panics um, around terms that take on an important signifying power in political discourses often are, these panics often serve uh, as an incitement or a pretext to enact certain legislative legislative changes, um, legal changes, organizational changes. It strikes me that DEI is more explicitly focused on um, corporations and federal government bureaucracy than the previous the previous panics uh, were, which tended to attract stories about college campuses, uh, street protests and so on. So that's one thing I'm, I'm really eager to hear more from the other panelists about, about what that might be and what specific work uh, DEI is doing on top of all these decades worth of, of discourse uh, about other um, essentially shibboleths or euphemisms for people who shouldn't be there according to the speaker. Yeah, thank you all. And I mean, <clears throat> I think that's actually a, a pretty good, that's a place where I wanted to go as well with my questions, Maura. Um, right, that, you know, we, on the one hand, it's hard not to come away with a sense of cyclicality here of like, here we go again. But um, I, I do think, I, I also notice this kind of, I don't know if escalatory logic, but like, it's definitely uh, the, the the targets are are new, right? And if you do want to draw the, as Maura just did, this really long line from, let's say, 
Reagan picks on public universities. Then by the 80s, the PC panic or 90s, the PC panic kind of finds Stanford, right? Like it's basically like you can be private and somehow it's not as a taxpayer, but as a consumer that you should care about whether, you know, Western Civ is under attack at Stanford. Then, you know, uh, and, 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 uh, you know, it, it does. It does feel like you know, with with the sort of woke ink kind of framing that that we're now really moving into a situation where, yeah, the the you know, it's corporate America and and the federal bureaucracy that are the are the um, the central kind of uh, areas of concern. And it's people like uh, Richard Hanania and and Chris Rufo kind of are are explicit in that. And you know, I think the latest attack appears to be on someone at NPR. I, I must admit, I have just sort of I just noticed that this morning. Um, so, it, you know, it, I, I'd, I'd like to hear people kind of talk about, you know, about that development, but also just the kind of what here's the historiographic problems that creates for us. Like, what, what are we, what is this escalation about? What is that shift about? Jamal? <laughs> 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 I'm 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 thinking I'm thinking about it. You know, I it seems if you listen to someone like Rufo, for example, the talk about how conservatives need to win the institutions, he talks of a long march through institutions, and it, it seems what the 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 escalation here is taking existing narratives about sort of liberal media bias or liberal institutional bias a couple of years ago, kind of, you know, clearly prefiguring this was the, the woke capitalism or woke capital um, uh, thing whereby, you know, Nestle putting out a diversity statement meant that somehow the company was like not Nestle. <laughs> um, uh, it, you know, it, it seems so a few things. As I, as I organize this. Um, first, it seems that the point here uh, is to pursue a pre-existing political program, right? Uh, 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 which is in the case of universities, sort of, of, of gutting humanities departments, sort of doing as much like the, the pursuing the pursuing the effort to really weaken the, the the social, cultural, and political power such that it is of academia um, and uh, create a situation where academics are, are more fearful of speaking out um, than not. So this, you know, part of this, and, and the, the Claudine Gay situation at Harvard, I think is a perfect example of this, sort of using, um, uh, finding a pretext for launching um, launching this kind of assault for pre-existing political uh, agenda. I think the escalation to targeting institutions, again, has a lot to do with the very real sense of, I'd say, like trauma that conservatives felt in the wake of the George Floyd protests. I, I kind of don't think we can overstate the extent to which the right broadly saw that in, in basically apocalyptic terms. Um, and even today, when you, you know, literally today, um, at oral arguments over the Supreme Court's hearing of, um, uh, you know, whether or not the law being used to charge from the January 6th rioters is legitimate. Uh, I believe Justice Thomas, you know, referred to violent protests. Like, it, you know, it's, it's a, there have been other kind of violent protests recently. Why are these ones getting this particular target? And you can see just in that language, in my, I see a direct allusion to those 2020 protests, um, which loom large in the imagination of conservatives. And so, you know, part of uh, the escalation here is conservatives asking themselves, how can we basically prevent that from ever happening again? Um, and it's targeting institutions that they feel have been, you know, corrupted or or have always been on the wrong side, but now need to be brought to heel. It is um, going after the the uh, the people who represent um, the kinds of cultural and social changes that produce something like the uh, 
uh, George Floyd protests. So the targets for this aren't just political and cultural institutions that you know have like you know, institutional power, but it's not hard to find on right wing social media complaints about DEI, DEI and like a new Star Wars property or DEI in um, the new Captain America movie, right? Like Captain is Captain DEI now. Um, it, it doesn't matter that the complaint is like so obvious. Um, I think I think what what connects all these things is a sense that the only way to preclude the kind of mass socially disruptive protest against against received hierarchies of race and gender is to um, uh, target those cultural forces, social forces, political forces, uh, and institutions that seem to be undermining them, whether actively or just by simple acknowledgement of, you know, some idea of, of, of racial or gender, gender equality. So it kind of, you know, it doesn't matter the fact that, <laughs> the fact that, um, uh, you know, you know, random mega corporation issues an MLK Day statement which for, you know, many people, for me, right, it's sort of like, yeah, you know, whatever, it's sort of, it's the thing that they do. It doesn't, it's not, in, it's not, it doesn't indicate anything deeper than sort of a PR person trying to do their job. Um, this becomes a specter of, you know, the malign forces undermining Western civilization. Yeah, I think I think all that's right. <laughs> uh, I I mean to be on a university campus today and to see uh, the discourse about university campuses is sometimes not to know uh, where the hell I am. Uh, it's because there is this sort of panic, I think, uh, uh, about what happens at universities, and uh, others on the call would know much more about this history, but schools and classrooms and schoolhouses have always uh, been the sites of contestation over power, right, and societal power. Uh, and the sense, uh, one can't help but believe that there's this sense among among those on the, on, on the right, at least some on the right, that it's not just a Claudine Gay or a Hakeem that's doing this sort of racial brainwashing, but there's buy-in from these white liberal elites who uh, are engaged in a kind of race trading uh, and and also offering up a kind of politics to young people uh, that is misaligned with uh, the racial group's interests. And I think Jamel is exactly right to point to uh, the 2020 protest activity as one very visceral moment uh, for some on on the right in particular, but not solely on the right, who saw this in the same light that they saw uh, the election of Barack Obama as the real threat to racial hierarchy. Uh, what does it mean uh, that so many Black people uh, and Black voices are elevated in this moment? Uh, whatever you think about Ibram X. Kendi, uh, a lot of people went out and bought his, bought his book. Uh, there was a, a lot of talk about uh, periods of enslavement, a lot of just a, a retelling of, of the kind of history that got us to a moment where a police officer could kneel on the neck of a Black man in broad daylight and murder him. Uh, and this discourse and the very images, and we can't, I think, ignore those images that that Jamel alludes to of, you know, front page New York Times stories about the multiracial coalition uh, that's standing in service of the advancing of racial justice. Uh, you know, some of us were skeptical of that moment and and said as much with Victor Ray, uh, I wrote at 538 and, uh, and the aftermath of all of this that that there would be, and we should expect this kind of backlash. And so I think thinking about uh, the attacks on DEI as a part of a long through line in American history of a kind of racial backlash, uh, 
uh, that when there is the perception of forward move it, movement and racial progress, there is this backlash. Uh, I mean, we have seen this at every turn. Uh, you get a Barack Obama, but you also get a Donald Trump. You get people reading, uh, again, whatever you think about it, even X Kindy's How to Be an Anti-Racist, and you get uh, the uh, the outing of a president at Harvard and all the kinds of attacks that we've seen on DEI and a kind of cultural moment. Uh, and I think that this is, I know that we're not there yet on the what comes next. I just think we're in for a long winter of this kind of thing. Uh, that there is apparently no slowing down. I mean, in response to a, a post about this event, I saw that one commenter said uh, DEI equals didn't earn it, right? Uh, this is a part of a way of thinking uh, that has been with us for a long time and I think will will remain. And again, institutions like Stanford and others uh, tacitly helped this along, that they too engaged in this kind of panic, that there's a free speech panic, which of course connotes uh, that there's a problem with wokeism on university campuses and that sort of thing. And so there's complicity all over the place. Uh, and I think that's why we're in for for a long haul here. Once again, I agree with a lot of what's been said um, in the past few minutes. Just to to touch down on one thing, I specifically think about with this question of escalation is about how maybe this is where Adrian and I are training in literature is uh, is all too obvious or something. But there's something about these how these terms get picked up and circulated that serve um, that serve the cycle of escalation. And I wanna say a hypothesis that I'm not sure I think is true, but I know is true in some past historical cases where I think um, when we look back at the history of how political correctness was taken up as a phrase in the 1990s, uh, and I've done this data crunching, I don't have the numbers immediately to mine, but it goes from being a term that appears almost nowhere in the printed record in the United States to a term that thousands of newspaper and, and magazine articles appear about per year very quickly uh, in the early 90s. Or we look at critical race theory, which again is a term that almost nobody has talked about in digitized mainstream news sources uh, until 2020. And all of a sudden there are hundreds of articles per week and per month and then I think that's why I want, I want to say there are 25,000 articles between the first time Christopher Rufo goes on Fox News in September 2020 and then January 2023 when I finished data collection for that particular thing. Um, but there's something about how these terms take on an almost totemic power that on the one hand clearly seems to have to do with being a dog whistle and in some of the nastier corners of the right with uh, cultural Marxism or critical, critical race theory, um, folks will avowedly say this. Uh, there's a notorious quote from David Duke, which I wanna say Jesse Daniels talks about in her book on cyber racism, where he says attacking the Frankfurt School is a way to name the Jew, you know, in general without having to do it obviously or, or something like that. Um, so again, in some corners quite explicitly picking up these terms that uh, in my tech frame, what I'd call them is their data voids. They're terms that don't have a lot of associations already. Uh, again, the average newspaper reader or um, Fox News watcher probably has never heard of critical race theory before. And therefore all these new significations can get attached to it. And that's true at a search engine level as well. Um, anyway, I think one important way that these terms serve to escalate is they become the basis for shared antipathy to something that's not quite, that is, disavowed or not explicitly defined and therefore uh, can be a site for the formation of new coalitions, if that makes sense, that there's a way that as these terms gain purchase, different political constituencies who are annoyed or angry about different things um, can come together around them without even sometimes having to acknowledge that that's what they're doing. If it's the case of, you know, white people who vote for the Democratic Party who think of themselves as liberals, uh, making common cause with folks they might not like to think of themselves as making common cause with on the right. So I think there's something about um, the mystification of some of these terms that facilitates that process of coalition building that 
often doesn't even name itself as such. It just calls itself common sense. You know, oh, folks all the time when they dismiss things as politically correct, posit that the opposite is common sense, right? Is, this, is that which is not political, is obvious to everyone. Um, all of that was a long wind up to say, I wonder about whether DEI is quite is quite the same because part of me thinks it's clearly another one of these phrases uh, that gets picked up and serves as an occasion for various stripes of backlash to come together. Uh, it certainly seems to be doing that work uh, around certain institutions of, of new kinds of coalition and alliance, alliance building at the present. At the same time, I think DEI is something more folks have experienced than critical race theory concretely, um, something that people uh, have some idea about what it is, I think. Uh, and in that respect, it seems a bit different from political correctness when it came on the scene in the 90s or critical race theory in 2020. Uh, but it certainly seems to me that this dynamic of escalation has something to do with how terms that have perhaps not been broadly, broadly discussed in the public sphere previously get taken up circulated and then become sticky for sort of different networks of actors or political coalitions to attach to them. Uh, that certainly seems true again. I think there's something really useful more about noting uh, the convenient way that it allows people to discuss so much all at once, right? Uh, what you've got me thinking about is the way that uh, these panics, as we've all regarded them, act as a kind of communicative device of grievance. Uh, and that that it takes a long while to describe how aggrieved I am by shifts or perceived shifts in a, in a hierarchy or to complain about the fact that uh, so-and-so got a job that I deserved or that as Jamel pointed out, that, that new avatar has some color or melanin in it. It's, that's all, it, it might also get you into trouble in some places, but uh, what a convenient sort of communicative device. And that's a really helpful way, I think, at least for me, that I hadn't really thought about, that these terms, CRT, DEI, and all of it, becomes just this really convenient offering of just a whole heap of grievance. So... Yeah, that, that was really helpful. Yeah, it seems to me really important to, I mean, I, I like the way you're putting that, Hakeem, that there's there's a kind of way of putting, you know, these panics all work to construct a connection to the person consuming the anecdote or whatever it is, right? The story or the the meme. And that that's sometimes easier than, that's sometimes easier than others, right? Like the the vast majority of Americans will not go to Harvard and yet Harvard stories somehow always go. Uh, so clearly there's some kind of imaginative investment, but you have to work at it. Whereas like, you know, DEI programs, I, I, I should have looked up what, for how, what percentage of Americans those are a reality. But like as Maura is saying, like that's a, definitely a larger percentage of Americans than what, go to or have ever had any association with, with, you know, Harvard or, you know, even an Ivy plus university. So it, it does seem there, there's something about it. It's, it's, it's connecting with people's um, everyday lives in a way that you know political correctness kind of had to work at. It's not that you couldn't do it, but you had to work at it. You had to sort of tell them, you know, that that way that your grandkids hate you. That's also political correctness, right? Like that's how you bring it home. But, but that's, um, but, but, but that that took extra steps with DEI. It almost doesn't. Um, I, I wanted to ask, is is that why we have that uh, crossover with this question of, you know, how um, this brazenness on the one hand, this this perfect out in the openness of this on the one hand, and on the other hand, this question of, you know, why is there so much liberal buy-in to all these things? Um, is that why? Is that it, it sort of is in people's lives more, or is there something else going on? Is there a different historic realignment happening, right? Why is it that that Rufo can say, oh, I'm going to use the New York Times, and the New York Times says, oh, cool, here's, let, let us now print what Chris Rufo wants us to print, basically. What is the, uh, sorry, Jamal, I know that that's your employer, but, uh, but there is this, um, but there is this, uh, right, th th there's a kind of an interesting disconnect there between, it's actually a very effective, apparently, coalition builder, while at the same time being, and I think you're all right to point to this, astonishingly open-hearted, astonishingly 
open about what it's doing, right? Astonishingly um, forthright in its own weird way. Um, how do these things go together? Is it because of this openness that it manages to to connect or is it just the sign of the times that it doesn't matter anymore? Yeah, I think that one thing the DEI message has going for DEI as sort of a stand-in for all sorts of grievances uh, and complaints. I think, and I think that um, you had, I think you had to work out with CRT as well, is that there already is a pre-existing kind of cultural narrative about merit and deservingness in elite spaces. It already, it's already there, right? It's been, I don't know how many of you spend any time on TikTok. I spend entirely too much time on TikTok, but it's sort of college, I guess it's college acceptance time. I don't know. It's For some students, they're getting their college acceptances around, around now. And it's been fascinating to watch videos of kids, you know, they've applied to lots of elite schools, to the Harvards and the Yales and the Browns and the Stanbridge, whatnot, whatnot, and they get their acceptances back or not, they get rejected. And they're very sad and, you know, they're very sort of like, oh, I, you know, I'm such a great, I'm such a great student, such a, a great applicant, you know, what happened? And then you, you'll go into the comments and you'll see people like immediately blaming affirmative action. And it's like, well, affirmative action uh, doesn't exist like that anymore. <laughs> So, uh, and even if it did, right, like statistically, virtually no one who applies to these things, these institutions gets accepted. Um, but there's a ready-made cultural narrative. There's a ready-made cultural narrative of uh, uh, a lack of deservingness uh, for elite positions, um, especially when, you know, Black people have them. Uh, and it, it, there's already, you know, the United States remains like an astoundingly segregated society. So it's not as if there are people who are encountering, uh, you know, especially Black Americans, in intimate spaces in everyday life. Like many Americans, simply, many white Americans simply do not. Um, it's not a thing that's part of their daily lives. Uh, but the cultural message is still there. And so I think I think that I think the DEI thing um, maybe gets some of its power from the fact that it is like plugging in to a thing that people are primed to believe. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, kind of pushing it aggressively forward. Now I say that not actually certain of how much this stuff has penetrated politically beyond basically, you know, for lack of a better term, like people who read the news on the Acela corridor. Like I'm not, I'm not really sure how much, uh, how, how, how much ground it's made. Um, part of me thinks more than we think. Uh, and I'll, I'll just wrap up with this last observation, which is that back when Ron DeSantis looked like a formidable or looked to some people like a formidable political candidate, candidate for president, one of the clear things that was developing around him was a kind of sympathy, like, white liberals who sympathize with this stance on the pandemic were sort of like willing to look past his cultural politics um, or, or, or rather whatever their grievance about lockdowns, they were able to, they were able to see him as, as, as someone who spoke to that. Um, well, not, well, kind of like putting a, a willing blinder on the other element of his cultural politics and I, you know, you see this in his campaigns he ran in Florida, but there is, there is a way that he was trying to figure this out, right? How do I build a coalition of grievance around pandemic grievance, racial grievance, gender grievance? Um, and if if had he had he made his way through a Republican primary, I think that would have been sort of the campaign that we look, we'd be looking at from him. Um, this kind of, you know, he, he, for not for nothing, right, he gave Rufo a job overseeing the new College of Florida, right? He's very much a part of this, this political project. Um, and so, yeah, that's just an observation. Like, you can sort of see the political the political coalitions trying to get pulled together um uh and to a certain extent it is like the fact of trump that is kind of the thing that is preventing them from cohering uh uh but take trump out the picture and i think i think there is like a there's a formation happening there
Thank you. That's, that's, that, I, that seems absolutely fascinating. And I think, um, I think that the, this, I, I've noticed this too. And in California, of course, we, we've gotten this for years now that we get these videos of students who say they didn't get into Berkeley because of affirmative action. And you can only kind of chuckle when you know how long there's been no affirmative action at UC Berkeley. But <clears throat> that kind of leads to my next question, which is this question that Hakim already alluded to, which, which what comes next, right? Like, you know, one of the reasons, you know, a, a lot of this stuff happened in California first, you know, we note with zero pride exactly, but, um, you know, in sort of the 90s. Um, and and it's, it's one thing about these panics is that they almost always turn into people kind of forget them after a while, but they but the legislation that they create is it stays around. Right. In California, we have Leonard Law, which basically uh, governs how stu how student uh, speech can be can be regulated. And, and and that's a leftover very, very clearly of the PC panic quite early in that, I think, 92 or 93. Uh, I should have looked that up. But um, what's what's noticing what's noticeable as I was looking at for the for my introduction, I looked at, you know, just the tracker, the DEI legislation tracker, and I was like, holy cow, this is fast. It's just moving at unbelievable speeds right now. And and um I I I do want to know um it's it's of course massively um, troubling, but it it's and this is something that already came up in the Q and A. It's of course making things materially worse for for people who work in that space, for students who depend on uh, support, for people in workplaces who might want to talk to someone about about uh, DEI questions, um, and and the, the the speed with which this transformation is happening, I think, is is also kind of sui generis. Like the, the, it took the PC panic. Um, quite a bit of time. Uh, I guess woke was different. Woke also was fairly quick, but we, we've gotten, you know, uh, partly because of the, you know, grievance accelerator that is Ron DeSantis, like these things tend to become law very, very quickly. But what do we make of that? What does that, how does that influence what's next? The fact that, the, that, that, you know, the, the number of laws is really, is really quite, quite staggering. And, and maybe also just because I know we have people working in that space, um, in states that have passed laws on the call or in in the in the Zoom uh, webinar, you know, do we have a sense of how this gets reversed? How one pushes back on it? How one works around it? Um, how how uh, well, what what comes next for them? Uh, I know it's a very big question, but I do think it's important to sort of um, dwell on the people who are almost who immediately are affected by this. So I wanted to uh, circle back just very quickly uh, sure. to this yeah. last question about coalition, uh, because as a political psychologist, I can't help but think about the psychology of all of this uh, kind of thing. And 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 you are asking about why why is the ground so fertile, as it were, for this kind of coalition building? And I can't help but think of work again that I've been doing with Koji Tagahashi, where. We were very interested in what we call this sort of feeling among some uh, white folks of a kind of racial voicelessness, the sense that uh, whatever I say about race is going to be taken out of context, that, uh, you know, uh, that what I say about race is given less weight uh, because I am white. Uh, and again, uh, it's just to say that, you know, we can think of highfalutin fancy ways of talking about this stuff. But this really is a conversation about power, right? And I think the sociologists have it right when they push us away from just thinking about these individual level differences of ideology and the like, which certainly moderates or conditions uh, some of these reactions. But to think about those, those group level concerns uh, that place people in hierarchy, that really does affect the way that people think about themselves and the world. And when I think like a sociologist, it's not so surprising uh, that not all of them, not even a majority of them, but that some white liberals feel sort of in community with some of these grievances uh, because our group identity so orients our place in the world and and really condition how we we think of ourselves. So that's all to say it shouldn't surprise us that uh, even powerful uh, folks who often have quote unquote good politics around 
around liberal ideas, uh, that liberalism sometimes falls falls away a little bit when race is brought to the fore uh, because race is so central uh, to how we we see ourselves, at least in, in this context. And so I just wanted to say that before answering uh, the second important question about what's next. I mean, uh, the fact that Republicans control so many state legislatures and, and governor houses, we should expect the continuation of these kinds of legislation. Of course, this is being actively uh, debated in the courts about what it means uh, to ban books. Uh, is it compelling speech? Is it violation of First Amendment rights? And and it still uh, is an open question as to how the courts will ultimately uh, rule on, on these questions. Uh, but more informally, uh, we're already seeing the changes this is having at places like universities. You know, there was just a piece uh, recently about how uh, how universities are changing uh, the names of various organizations uh, and offices on campus. I think Dartmouth uh, now has the <laughs> Office of Pluralism and Leadership or something like that. And I mean, we're already seeing... Uh, the ways that this is affecting programming and uh, the removal of different kinds of scholarship opportunities and the like. Uh, Institutions uh, and universities are many things. Uh, They are often not courageous. Uh, And I think in the face of this kind of attack on DEI programming and the like, we're going to see a lot of universities fearful of being called before a congressional committee, fearful of being investigated, uh, fearful of losing dollars, particularly uh, public institutions, but private institutions uh, like this one, it's not immune to this either. I think we're going to see, again, as a part of this long winter, a lot of giving in and giving up. uh, Because again, institutions are not often courageous when it comes to race and issues of equity. Uh, And so I think that's what we have, at least in the immediate future, uh, and what stands in the long term, I think, still remains to be seen. I find that very compelling and persuasive, and I think, um, though sober, you know, depressing as well. Um, But I think, yeah, the only things I'd I'd add to that is I think... um, I think this kind of discourse serves to delegitimate institutions and to justify their ongoing privatization and dismantling and so on and their subjection to the logics of the market. Um, And I think, I think, you know, in the 1990s history that I've looked at these fights over the canon, the great books, um, the great books courses and political correctness the outcome was not that the culture warriors won and therefore, you know, everyone got to read Plato in these well-funded public institutions. The result was the legitimation of defunding public institutions um, at the end of the Cold War. And if you take a sort of view from Mars, look at it, I almost find myself thinking, you know, there was no longer an adversary who legitimated this level of science funding and also this kind of commitment to a certain kind of cultural liberalism and pluralism by way of contrast. I mean, the USSR, I don't think China plays that role for the United States today. Uh, Anyway, much to say about that. But I think, um, yeah, in addition to fueling a backlash and speeding the passing of more legislation that this this moral panic continues uh, to legitimate the destruction of common things and institutions and there's no it's no accident it's about libraries uh and public schools and universities uh and i think um there's actually a a way that all these different um attacks on institutions of what what i would call social reproduction you know the institutions that recreate um society and the people in it over time um converge and sort of fit together uh fit together in this way. And I think also on the liberal side of things, one aspect of 
that strikes me that's also about social reproduction is that in some way, even among quite privileged, um, quite privileged white liberals and communities, I think some of these anxieties about access to privilege and the sort of sustainability of um, social life, if we want to call it that, at a high level of abstraction obtained too. And I think part of the intensity of the reaction um, to things like DEI or wokeness or cancel culture among people who self-identify as, as liberal is about these really intimate, um, intimate anxieties about sort of loss of privileges for their children. Where did they think their children would get to go to school because they went to go, they got to go to school there and maybe now that won't be available. And I think, um, yeah, I'm only agreeing with what's been said for the most part, but I think some of the affective or psychological intensity uh, that one finds around these issues in communities where you might not expect to find it, um, you know, not the white working class of the anti-Trumpist imagination uh, has to do with a sense of not any longer being able to assume uh, certain privileges uh, and that the perpetuation of a certain social status over time. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm wondering, this is also, it's one, one of the interesting things about, and, and this is already brought up, and I think after this, we should probably move on to some questions from the audience. But uh, one of the big kind of questions for me is always, right, uh, this is really, you know, the moment when corporate America is also in the firing line of the, of this panic, which some, is something that really was exempt from for for some time, and and that of course is like the one the one institution that that you know someone like Chris Rufo would probably claim to love, and, it, and it's interesting in its own way that like, um, there it's not th these panics are strike me as not straightforwardly institutionalist or straightforwardly anti-institutionalist. That is to say, they both, like like the Claudine Gay, uh, uh, the discourse about Claudine Gay at Harvard, held Harvard allegedly in high esteem, just not as it was actually constituted, right? Like th these are not, um, and the same is true for, for you know, the for the university uh, in the political correctness panic, right? It, on the one hand, they seem to have an overly rosy picture of the university and then they had to, the exact opposite picture at the same time right they were like oh it's terrible it's a, it's a laughing stock global laughing stock also you know you know just about five minutes ago it was great or something like that and 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 this is kind of extending that to to a bunch of of institutions where it's basically it, it's both um this kind of I'm guessing, you know, one could call it a Trumpist kind of love of tearing down institutions and just kind of watching them, watching them disintegrate, uh, you know, as part of the deep state or something like that. On the other hand, you have the kind of still institutionalist impulses. I went to that school. I want my children to go to that school, right? Like there is a kind of still a remaining investment. And I'm wondering, what does that do when that's applied to corporations? It's, it's to me, you know, as someone who, loves universities a whole lot more than corporations. That's kind of an interesting moment, isn't it? Uh, when suddenly they, they, uh, you know, you know, I, I don't want to say, you know, it's like, gee, now you know how it feels, but it is really, it's, it's putting something in the line of fire um, of something that really was designed. I think as you all very much persuasively arguing to delegitimate public institutions or institutions in which the public felt itself to have some sort of stake, even if they were quote unquote private institutions, right? It was to some extent your tax dollars at work. That's not the case when Disney is going woke according to Vivek Ramaswamy, right? Like it's interesting to think about like, what does it do when, when that sort of corrosive now sort of seems to, you know, I'm going to mix a bunch of metaphors here, but it seems to kind of arrive in at, at corporations as well. Can we can we talk about that? Yeah, you know, I'm not really sure what it does, right? Like, at the end of the day, for for especially for uh, the corporations that are producing, you know, concrete products or cultural products, it's like you know, markets. The, a market for diverse casting exists, right? And so it's unclear to me what the end game is of denouncing a company like like disney like what do you you know 
it remains the case that there are many, many tens of millions of people in the country who are going to go um, see a Little Mermaid movie with a black lead, right? Like, which a movie that did quite well for Disney. We lost you, Jamel. You're on mute, I think. Uh, I'm not on mute, huh. but huh. my um my mic died. So uh, same difference. Uh, <laughs> I was just saying that I think the purpose of the attacks on these corporations is less to to get them to do anything, um, uh, perhaps other than you know issue a press release saying you know maybe we're not going to do x y or z program the more it's like social glue it's like social binding for these communities of people engaged in this tax especially online oh i wanted to say just thinking for thinking of a path forward um and thinking of how much of the potential coalition building i think depends on the coalition building for you know this this kind of reactionary movement depends on tapping into people's anxieties about social reproduction, about the ability of their children to get good educations, go to good colleges, um, uh, you know, live in decent neighborhoods. I think that implies right sort of like a a genuinely kind of like social democratic political project in response. Right, that's the only way to maybe try to short circuit. Um, this play is to say, in fact, these institutions do not have to be zero sum. They do not have to be limited. We can expand them. We can make them bigger, more capacious, so on and so forth. Um, but it does require meeting, I think, this rhetoric and meeting these things head on and like calling them for what they actually are. Um, in the last election cycle in 2023, there were all of these victories on the local level of people pushing back against Moms for Liberty candidates and school boards and such. And the kind of the common thread between all of them was that the candidates running against the the the, the local politics version of all this were not did not beat around the bush about what they were running against, right? They were quite open about the fact that, you know, we don't want people taking but banning books. We don't want people, you know, doing X, Y, and Z. And, you know, to the extent that there's been like one major electoral victory for all of this, which was the 2021 Virginia race, it's striking that the Democratic candidate in that race never really opened, like pushed back openly, never, never, never named and labeled the thing. Um, and I think in naming and labeling the thing, and taking advantage of the very real tension between the resentments people might feel, but also the larger social values they want to say they adhere to is like an important part of a political strategy, like recognizing that even if people may feel, you know, like uh, resentful of one thing or another, they also want to believe that they are good, inclusive people. And you can, you can, you can, you can, you can, you can capture that. You can you can play those two things against each other. Yeah, I think I think that's right. Uh, and I was heartened too to see that uh, using a positive language of freedom uh, against these sort of negative uh, attacks on banning books and the like did seem uh, to be effective in in some places. I think that that can be a political strategy, and one we saw. Uh, Joe Biden and uh, and Kamala Harris sort of employ uh, in various places as well, talking about what it means that uh, people are banning books, banning books, you know, uh, and so maybe that's a, a, a way forward. I, I wanted to go back, uh, Adrian, just to this question about corporations, which I think Maura and, uh, and Jamel have spoken quite well about uh, in social reproduction. Uh, I do think it's interesting that I think for a lot of, Americans and white Americans in particular, or perhaps for all of us, the, the sort of symbolic image of corporations, I'll speak for myself, uh, when I think about how corporations are, rec are are sort of represented in my own cognition, I think of them as these sort of conservative organizations uh, that at some level do the bidding, whatever that means, 
of a kind of conservative politics. Uh, and I think, you know, just as a uh, political science colleague, Michael Tesler, you know, basically shows in his work that everything Barack Obama touched uh, turned black, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I think that's the same with this current moment and uh, the sort of discourse of DEI or what it represents is corporations. Uh, it's like when Oprah endorsed Barack Obama or Colin Powell endorsed Barack Obama, you know, these were for some white Americans, de-racialized, you know, social, I don't want to use the word objects, but social beings, until, of course, uh, they endorsed uh, a Black candidate. And I think the same way is true for corporations, that the sort of way that they're represented in mind changes the more that they adopt this language that is so deeply racialized. And so when corporations respond to this visceral murder of George Floyd, right, they give up that currency uh, that they've long had among at least some large share of white people. Because in that moment, to align themselves temporarily uh, with a kind of racial progress is to change their representation and the mind of some white Americans. And so there is no contradiction, uh, I think, for people like Chris Rufo and many others. It was that these corporations had buy-in from this segment of the public so long as they stayed away from uh, these kinds of seemingly racially progressive uh, uh, policy positions. And so the same way uh, that that individuals are blackened or racialized by way of their proximity uh, to other candidates who are perceived to be racialized. I think this is what we've seen uh, with corporations as it comes to Disney or, or any of the other companies that have taken these sorts of positions. I think the only thing I'd add on corporations specifically, um, because I did uh, suffer through Chris Rufo's book, I did read it, <laughs> um, it's just I remember the moment when he starts talking about uh, corporations and he has this sort of special ire that is, I think it's structurally analogous to this split um, or contradictory attitude to the universities where on the one hand they're full of you know, critical race theorists who don't deserve to be there. And then on the other hand, he really still cares because Harvard's Harvard and he has a deep investment in certain ideas about hierarchy and deservingness and so on. And the moment where he talks about corporations, there's this similar contradiction where he's, um, where he's on the one hand annoyed because corporations should only respond to the rules of the market and therefore should be part of this sort of highly naturalized, you know, part of play an important symbolic role in this broad uh, reactionary belief that hierarchy is natural and anything that interferes with it is unnatural or something. Um, and on the other hand, he dismisses corporate DEI initiatives as just cynicism. So he's sort of mad because the, the company should not be doing anything except realizing the, the natural, and I'm using air quotes around natural hierarchies that result from capitalist competition. Um, and then on the other hand, uh, he's, he's also mad because the corporations aren't actually making the world more equal and just. And I feel that there's a similar double bind that emerges around the university uh, where on the one hand, and, and this happens again and again throughout the anti-CRT literature. It's like, well, on the one hand, look, it's a bunch of racially progressive Marxists or whatever the dog whistle is. Um, on the other hand, look, they haven't actually made society less equal at all, rather, excuse me, less unequal at all. And, um, and that that same move is done with the corporation. I think in a very broad historical perspective that I just wanted to add, it strikes me to, um, and I'd have to think a bit about how empirically true this is or isn't for different parts of this political coalition, but that the imaginary of a lot of these reactionary new social movements is very much this neo-Jeffersonian imaginary that in a way wants to go back to the era before these 20th century social forms like objective journalism 
or um, or the research university in this particular form that it that it takes in the 20th century United States, um, you know, where it's both a site of research and education. Uh, and I think there's this, and then again, in Rufo's book, and I don't wanna place too much emphasis on him because I think it's a mistake to focus too much on any one of these uh, figures. But in his book, there's this very explicitly um, Neo-Jeffersonian fantasy about decentralized communities, uh, you know, where you don't depend on the public school or the university. And I think the corporation is part of that. It's a 20th century institution uh, that comes, that is run through a lot of the 20th century and now still by a certain managerial elite that's credentialed at certain, certain institutions. Um, and so I think to that extent, the attack on the corporation is somehow actually not pure market enough or something and not decentralized enough is actually pretty consistent um, with the attack on schools and universities, even though those of us who work at universities don't like to remember that they're run by corporations. Well, at this university, it's very hard to forget. But um, I, I think there's something really fascinating about something that that all of you have, have, um, have been sort of pointing to, which is uh, this you know the, the idea that that corporations sort of maneuver themselves they 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 can they can either occupy there's a, like create the, the discourse creates a kind of a phony zone of neutrality and getting out of that is sort of made to be fraught um and it it, it uh, I'm bringing that up because there's a question in the Q&A about about the way that that's also happening with uh with trans people very much so and that that that's another area where where this there's been a flurry of uh, of um, of of legislative action, uh, and it's probably the only one I can think of that has that level of speed. The other one that has that level of speed, and and the 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 questioner is is asking us to kind of reflect on that. And I wanted to just throw it out there because I to me I, that also immediately I noticed that that there's that it, it, it's not quite the same. You know, question of visibility, but but there is, but but corporations. If you think about the Bud Light fiasco from last year, that was essentially the same thing as a DEI panic, uh, except around around gender identity. And but but there are there do seem to be differences, and I just wanted to throw it out there whether folks wanted to could do something with that. I was just going to remark that Jamel wrote a a stunning piece. I thought about uh about the way uh, about dignity and and trans politics so it's the first thing that came to mind for me uh as you were asking this question and i thought uh, jamel did a really nice job and and that piece of of moving a lot of these pieces uh together and uh i of course wouldn't put him on the spot but I just wanted to note for the questioner uh, that I think uh, I think this piece that Jamal wrote on on trans politics and dignity uh, is a is a really useful way, uh, at least for me, to put it into conversation with a lot of the uh, ways of thinking that we brought to bear on this theme of DEI and and sort of what's at stake. Yeah, I mean, we, we've been discussing for the most part kind of the, you know, the institutional and political aspect of this. But again, as as was um, noted at the very beginning, there is an aspect of this that is also simply about who belongs and who is entitled to respect and who is re entitled to due regard. Um, and I think that's where the, the, the that's where you could make the connection to the, the gender panics, because, you know, very much the, the, the trans, the anti-trans movement is not simply rejecting the notion of transness, but also saying, right, that like these people do not deserve dignity in our society. They do not deserve the kind of regard that we give people who are cisgender. Um, and the, the hounding of individual transgender people um, that we've seen is very reminiscent of the hounding of so-called like DEI hires and, and, and prominent positions. Um, it is, it is, I think it's a testament to the marginality of, of sort of trans identity that, right, like they're not aiming at presidents of major research universities. They're aiming at like, you know, a young woman who got a beer can. <laughs> right? um, uh, they're aiming at 13-year-olds uh, uh, who want to play sports 
uh, with their friends. Um, uh, they're not they're not aiming at, at people with institutional power. But I think I think I think the the extent to which uh, it, <laughs> I just know this it's like getting dark here. So I'm I'm like I'm shrouded in darkness now. Um, the extent to which uh, so much of this is about uh, who is entitled to, to to dignity and public displays of it and and and, and public recognition and due regard uh, can't be can't be overstated. I think what? the intent. Oh. oh, sorry. Uh, no, go I ahead, was go. just gonna, going to say I. I think that the intensity of the panic over um, over gender also just clearly bespeaks how profoundly um, either explicitly reactionary or even um, neoliberal visions of society sort of depend on a gendered reproduction, uh, reproducing sort of a gender division of labor to uphold these very notions of public and private um, that are at stake here. And in a sense, um, it seems to me that the intensity of these attacks on trans people, who, as Jamel is saying, are not even, you know, university, I mean, just presidents, just the real cruelty of attacks on people who do not necessarily have much power or visibility uh, bespeaks um, perceived threat uh, to this gender division of labor um, and uh, and yet yeah, centrality to this project of privatizing everything and upholding sort of certain visions of hierarchy and the home and the private against public institutions that have historically been sites of mixing desegregation mobility. Yeah, thank you. That's that's great, and I think that the 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 other question that that came up here that I think is is really interesting to think about is is the question of expertise, and this gets to something that that I think Moira uh, brought up at the very beginning when we sort of went around, um, which is sort of the, the question of um, you know the the DEI sort of made you know it questioned the expertise right the, the DEI panic questions the expertise of people who are perceived as DEI hires right. The other thing it did, and I noticed this when I made the mistake of writing about the Claudine case for a German newspaper, and I got a bunch of emails about, and it turns out that like no one is a bigger expert in the tenure uh, standards of Harvard University than German dudes uh, who wrote to me. Uh, and, and it got me thinking, the fact that there's essentially, that there is a, a withdrawal of authority and respect, but there's also a kind of self-authorization, right? Suddenly everyone is, sorry, but it's like a freaking... Uh, expert on citation practices, right? And like, this is, you know, like, you know, I'm a PhD advisor, so I have to be, but like, it's weird. It's not, it's not totally understandable why that would be, why, why it would make everyone suddenly an expert in this. And then we have someone uh, asking in the, in, in uh, the Q and A about, you know, being being a surgeon and being like, no, this person is actually a good surgeon, and people being like, B yeah, I agree to disagree, right? Um, and I do wonder about this, like this. Um, because Moira brought up the question of of the fact that this seems to thrive in certain spaces, the the in, the tech industry's investment in you know the in in this kind of um, delegitimation of traditional um, expertise and also this sort of self arrogation, right? For lack of a better term, let's call it Elon Musk. The fact that like that man just clearly thinks he's pretty good at a bunch of stuff, which I mean like, he's good at some things, but he definitely has, you know. A greater uh, estimation of his own sense of, you know, cave diving, for instance, <laughs> and actual cave divers. And so I'm wondering, um, what what is that all about? Is this is, is that something that that um, is that an effect of the social media age? Is it a part of the Silicon Valleyization? Is it a part of the kind of de-skilling that Moira has brought up several times now? Is this about about uh, you know wh why where does that come from? We've talked about the denial of of expertise. Where does this incredible confidence, this unearned confidence in assigning oneself the ability to say, well, that person's a bad surgeon when one has never you know, held a scalpel in one's life. Where does that, where, where does that come from? And why is it succeeding now rather than 20 years ago? Why was it not so much? Why, why did people only think that about an English professor teaching Alice Walker and not about the person who was going to take their tonsils out? I guess is a way of asking that question. Well, I had this experience of teaching at Stanford where 
I found myself in the front of a classroom having to defend my expertise uh, uh, in front of a classroom filled with uh, 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 white students, uh, a couple of whom had no regard, I am certain, uh, for the fact that I have a PhD in political science, that I've studied race, that I think deeply about these questions. Uh, that what what gives the confidence? Uh, I think I think at some level we know. I mean, uh, is 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 again Victor A. writes in and his work on racialized organizations, whiteness as a credential, and uh, let's just add white maleness as a credential, uh, and the perception that the thing in those moments where I felt. The guy was defending my own expertise. It was that there was something in view uh, that could override any sort of educational credential I had. And that was my Blackness. <laughs> I mean, intertwined with the fact that everybody can be an expert on race because everybody experiences it. But there is no way that one can have special expertise or the same about other markers of identity say gender what does it mean uh one ask uh, to be an expert on this thing that i too know so much about and so that's all to say i think we we know well what what provides the credential for those who are without it across any domain that is unrelated to their own specialized expertise and it's often whiteness and in at least my experience it's white madness uh, that provides a credential that can override a PhD in political science from the University of Michigan. This is at a bit of a, tan a tangent, but since Adrian, you mentioned the tech industry, they're also, sorry, I'm trying to thread this so that it connects directly to expertise, but there are also these historical examples of um, as the power and status associated with certain professions shifts, then different kinds of people take those professions. So in the history of computing, the famous example is that all the coders are women at the beginning. And uh, all the, in Jennifer Light, the historian of science has a famous article about this called when computers were women, the term computer referred to women who did this job. Um, and, Mar Hicks has a book about this programmed inequality, but then as programming becomes higher status and higher paid than hardware, women are pushed out of the profession systematically. And I think um, to take up the question the way you posed it, Adrian, with why being a surgeon is expertise and knowing about Alice Walker novels isn't or something, I think it's also about what kinds of work um, give access to power and standing um, and then predictable white white people, male people um, can occupy those those positions. And so there's this curious thing about, about expertise where it's not just about unearned confidence, um, but actually what kind of knowledge is specialized enough to be seen as expert depends. I know there's research that shows it on how the people who are occupying those positions are are embodied. Um, and just to give one last shout out, my friend Miriam Posner wrote an article I thought that was great about this called um, JavaScript is for girls, but about how front end coding was sort of devalued as more and more women learned how to do it. Um, and so, yeah, I think a lot of these meritocratic fantasies and rhetorics suggest falsely that it's about, you know, some clear expertise that people should compete to get into to possess, but we know that um, status and expertise sort of co-construct one another from reams of both historical and sociological research. Well, so I think we're at time actually. So it's uh, five o'clock and uh, thank you so much to our three panelists. This was a a terrific uh, exchange. I'm, I'm really, I mean, there's there's still much to talk about, but uh, we can reconvene and see how much more is, has gone, come down the pipeline in a few 
few months or years. But uh, for now, I think you've really done a terrific job in kind of situating us and, and giving us a sense of what's happening, which is, you know, as I think people have been expressing in the Q&A, is all the more valuable when things are moving so quickly. And I think that that we really have been able to to hopefully shed some light on that, answer some questions. And for now, just a big claim and thank you to all three of you. And we hope to see you on Stanford's campus. Well, I mean, Akeem is here, but uh, the other two come, you know, don't be strangers, uh, stop by in person and uh, maybe we'll do this again. Well, hopefully on a different topic and we're not still talking about this, but I, like you, I do not hold my breath. Um, I, uh, but, but you know, hopefully in person next time. But thank you so much for being here, and uh, thank you all for attending. So uh, uh, thank you, and until soon. <laughs>